Hi there, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. It seems like Sandra Bullock sped into our lives years ago and has been there ever since. I met up with her at the popular Austin eatery she owns to talk about fame, food, and the role she cherishes above all else. You know, my children are black. I have, I have a level of defense that, that millions of mothers have that aren't white. You know, I have an understanding of how scary it is, and um, I, just, I just get really emotional because I think of hundreds of years of women who've never been able to relax into motherhood. They've never been able to relax. Worried about their kids. But yes, in a way that we as white women have not had to worry. You worry about other things, but if you really, really, really take a minute and think about hundreds of years of mothers not being able to enjoy freely the birth of a child, uh, their son becoming a young man, all of those things represent fear and loss from the day that they're born. We talked about much more, including a very important job she had before gracing the silver screen. That's coming up later in the show. So you eventually went to school for acting. You end up in New York mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You become a waitress. The precursor to acting is you become a waitress. Which I think everyone in life should do. I think you're absolutely right. If you, if you are in the way, if you know, know how to navigate uh, eight sets of six top tables, height of happy hour, drunk people, and you can do it without writing anything down, and you can remember everything, you can prevent yourself from being in the weeds. Once you've accomplished that kind of rhythm, I, feel, I honestly feel you can do anything. Then John Dickerson sits down for a performance and a nostalgic look back with award-winning pianist Jeremy Denk. One of my father's favorite pieces was the Saint-Saëns -Saint Symphony No. 3, the Organ Symphony. About three quarters of the way through the piece, where the orchestra is diminuendoing, my dad called me up to the couch. He was like, listen, we're listening, you know? And then suddenly this organ comes in with the loudest C major chord ever. <laughs> and my dad looked over at me and he said, holy crap. <laughs> so you say it's your first musical lesson. What did you learn? The sheer joy of surprise in music. And I think that was part of what we shared on the couch there. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. She's an A-list star, an Oscar winner with more than her share of drama on and off screen. And through it all, though, Sandra Bullock's sunny disposition seems to always shine through. On one of the coolest streets in Austin, a go-to for the hip and the hungry. This is Walton's Fancy and Staple, a cafe and flower shop in a century-old brick building, owned and restored by actress-producer Sandra Bullock. I love the idea of finding purpose for something that was created for another purpose originally. This place, which was once a horse and carriage repair shop, is now a destination for local foodies. To me, this is just as fulfilling as making movies. And if you know her movies, that's really saying something. There are just hundreds of snakes in this temple just waiting for us to show up. What? Why aren't they biting that guy? This is ridiculous. Delete. In Delete. The Lost City, from our parent company Paramount, she's a kidnapped romance novelist. Unchain me! That's your seatbelt. Who, along with her book's cover model, Channing Tatum, fights her way back to civilization through some harrowing and comically cringeworthy situations. Ah, no! What is that? Stop screaming. Get them all. Oh my God. Get okay. No, I can't touch this blood gorge mucus sac. Can you right fling now. it? Can you, why don't Get you it. just pick it and fling it? Just pick it and you fling it. You pick it and fling it. It's refreshing that the person taking their clothes off is the guy. Because nobody wanted me to do it. <laughs> Think I'm kidding? Not. Um, <laughs> And Channing was the one willing to work out all the time. I was like, I'm not willing. It's the latest chapter in a career that's taken her from a speeding city bus in 1994's Speed. It'll be one hell of a ride. To an even more harrowing trip in 2013's Gravity. I'm in a dress. I have gel in my hair. I haven't slept all night. I'm starved and I'm armed. Don't 
mess with me. Of course, she's also known for her brand of physical Whoa. comedy. I'm fine. I'm cool. I'm good. It's something she says she learned at an early age, thanks to her mom. My mother had no sense of humor, unless you hurt yourself. And then she would laugh her ass off. So I realized the way to my mother's heart was through physical comedy. So you would do practice. I would falls. fall all the time. And it's fair to say the film world fell for her. Oh! She's made four oh, dozen no. plus no. movies. Oh, oh my why God! Why are you, why are you making? Earned countless accolades. You protect his blind side. When you look at him, you think of me. But also had her share of some real world grief. Play along with me on a scale of one to ten. Mm -hmm. How's life now? I'd say it's, you know, it's it's my life, so it's about a 9.2. That's very specific. Why 9.2? Because the other shoe will drop. It will. The other shoe seemed to drop hardest in 2010. It started happily enough with the surprise adoption of her first child. He was unexpected. He was not planned. I. I got a call one day, and your placement is here. And that's after years after having filed. Years. Oh, my gosh. Then um, just out of the blue. Boom. It literally was out of the blue. And so I was handed a plastic bag and a child. And the winner is Sandra Bullock. <laughs> and a few weeks later, with the adoption still a secret, she was handed an Oscar for the blind side. Did I really earn this, or did I just wear you all down? But wow. even during her acceptance speech, she says her mind was on her baby. All I kept thinking about was he's at home. Like, I, I didn't care. I didn't care that it was there. I just wanted to go home. And then I was sewn in the dress. I was sewn in the dress, and I had to get myself out of the dress. But all I wanted to do was just go home and feed Luke. How do you get yourself out of a dress you when you're sewn it. in? You just, you rip, just it. rip it. You just rip it. <laughs> I ripped it. And then I asked him to fix it. I go, I don't know what happened. Like, all the beats came off. <laughs> and days later, the wheels came off her marriage to reality star Jesse James, leaving her to raise her infant son alone and shut out the rest of the world as best she could. I mean, so much had happened. How do you process grief and not hurt your child in the process? It's a newborn. They take on everything that you're feeling. So my obligation was to him and not tainting the first year of his life with my grief. Bullock has since adopted a little girl as well. She's asked us not to use photos of her kids. She says that even in her privileged world, she's had a real taste of the battles other mothers fight every day. You know, my children are black. I have, I have a level of defense that, that millions of mothers have that aren't white. You know, I have an understanding of how scary it is. And um, I, just, I just get really emotional because I think of hundreds of years of women who've never been able to relax into motherhood. They've never been able to relax. Worried about their kids. But yes, in a way that we as white women have not had to worry. You worry about other things, but if you really, really, really take a minute and think about hundreds of years of mothers not being able to enjoy freely the birth of a child, uh, their son becoming a young man, all of those things represent fear and loss. Career-wise, Bullock wanted to give the audience something to smile about. Why are you so handsome? My dad was a weatherman. But she says that The Lost City yeah. will be her last film, at least for now. I don't want to manscape you. I didn't bring my clippers. I can be creative. I can be part of a community. But right now, work in front of the camera needs to take a pause. For how long? I don't know. I don't know, until I don't feel like I feel now when I'm in front of a camera. Which is? I want to be at home. I'm not doing anyone any favors who's investing in a project if I'm saying I just want to be at home. Because I was always running. I was always running to the next thing. I just want to be present and responsible for one thing. So you knew shooting this movie, yeah. this is going to be the last one yeah, for, for a while. while. Yeah. And I don't know what a while is. I don't know what that is. I, I would just love to clean out the basement. You're being literal. I'm literal. I have a room where all my shit goes for all the years. I want to go through it, and I want to see if I remember any of it. 
is, are the golden eggs right there. I mean, they're, they're unassuming, but they're my sister's golden recipe. Eggs. Combination of a churro, a donut, and a snickerdoodle. Her family comes first, at home and here, where her sister, Gigi, designs some of the pastries. Are you a sweets person? Do you yeah, like big time. I have a problem. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> or just maybe Sandra Bullock knows when something is sweet and has learned to cherish it. What do you see out in front of you now? <laughs> She's like, I see a crystal ball. Um, I don't know. That's what's a little scary about it. I don't know. Watch, six months from now, I can't handle this anymore. I need to go back to work. But I don't want to do that. If that feeling comes, I don't want to do that. I don't want to rely on work to fill me. But I just, I just don't see a lot other than everyone under my roof. That's it. I was not very sexy, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's mine. More exclusive excerpts from our conversation coming up in just a few minutes. But up next, well, just have a listen. Maybe you learned the acronym for the treble clef in grammar school music class, Every Good Boy Does Fine. That's the name of concert pianist Jeremy Denk's new book. But he's done much, much better than just fine in his renowned career. Here's John Dickerson. That's a very good cheese, you know. You could have a more French cheese, you know. But then, you know, sometimes you want a good old German cheese. Mm -hmm. Why is this man at the piano talking about cheese? Because classical pianist Jeremy Dank is trying to put his finger on classical music. And he knows that means more than putting his fingers on the keys. It's a charming waltz. Dank, an award-winning pianist, is the author of Every Good Boy Does Fine, a performer's love song to the craft of the thing piano students usually hate, Practice. Ooh, I'll have to play that next week. Young Jeremy's first musical lesson took place not at the piano, but on the sofa of his boyhood home in New Jersey. One of my father's favorite pieces was the Saint-Saëns Symphony No. 3, the Organ Symphony. About three quarters of the way through the piece, where the orchestra is diminuendoing, my dad called me up to the couch. He was like, listen, we're listening, you know? And then suddenly this organ comes in with the loudest C major chord ever. <laughs> and my dad looked over at me and he said, holy crap. <laughs> so you say it's your first musical lesson. What did you learn? The sheer joy of surprise in music. And I think that was part of what we shared on the couch there. Having felt the connection between music and emotion, head and heart, Dank, age 10, had to learn to settle his hands. We moved to New Mexico, and I had a new teacher at the New Mexico State University, William Leland. Together, they kept a notebook, marking his progress. Through the drawings in your book, he seemed to have an aptitude for communicating with a 10-year-old. But I was a weird 10-year-old also, you know, a little bit like, you know, partly 10 years old and partly 50. And he was very determined to build me a technical foundation so that I could actually realize some of the things that I was trying to do musically. He made me play. He thought my thumbs were weak, which they, they were. Um, so you had to think about, keep your hand quiet and bring your thumb like a little crab under the hand, right? And then go further. <laughs> and then, Go a little, and then go further, right? He made me do this for, oh God, un unbelievable hours. You know, it's even traumatizing me yes. right now to think about to play it. And it seemed like the most miserable possible enterprise. You know, like the whole point of piano lessons was to drain all the pleasure from music that, you know. Why didn't it drain all the pleasure out of it for you? It, it did at moments, but then, you know, I would listen to some piece and then, you know, like, oh yes, this is, what music is for. Do you feel any fellow feeling with Olympic athletes? They've done all the kinds of practice that you write about and that you do, and then the moment comes. Is that similar at all? It's so similar that I 
can barely watch Olympic competition. Dank's love of music grew, despite the hours of practice, leading to a bout of evangelical fervor on the bus to school. I was not a fan of popular music in those days. I was an extremely elitist little <laughs> brat, you might say. And I thought, you know, people need to learn that there's something better out there to listen to. So he stuffed a cassette player in his backpack, got on the bus, and pushed play. The conversation like slowly comes to a halt and people are looking around, you know, with this horrible, you know, like, what is that terrible smell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> As skilled in the classroom as at the piano, Denk left for the prestigious Oberlin Conservatory of Music at age 16. There, he found teachers who pushed him almost as much as he pushed himself. Is there something intrinsic to, to the teaching of classical piano that requires yeah, sure. hard teaching? There is a long tradition of mean, you know, abusive teaching. You know, even the teachers that were m meanest to me I'm still assuming they did it, you know, because I needed it, yeah. yeah, in a way. But sometimes they didn't realize what a sea of anxiety and insecurity I was, mm -hmm. you know, underneath. Dank won the highly competitive senior concerto competition at Oberlin and was set to move to his next teacher in California. But after hearing George Shebuk, he moved to Indiana instead to study under him. I never really loved Bach until that moment. <laughs> But the way he played that, moving his hands so smoothly and beautiful, but also with this little smile, and that you felt that his smile, physical smile, was also present in the notes, too. That the music had this beatific quality, but also this sense of play. And I don't think many of my teachers had told me to play with play yet. I think I so desperately needed what Shebuk was offering at that moment, that I, I needed a sense of the wider purpose of piano playing and some sort of also this European perspective. What is the emotional meaning? Like the musical score is like a treasure map, you know, mm -hmm. telling you, you know, here are the, here's how you create this piece. You know, here's how you bring it alive. Here's how you do it. And, and it's not a misery, but it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful guide. The mixture of technique and play has won Denk critical acclaim, including a MacArthur Genius Grant. He now tours the world, playing with great orchestras and classical music superstars like Joshua Bell. Practicing now a joy in itself. How long can you go without practice? What happens if, if, if it gets into about the middle of the second day? It's like an itch. Maybe it's an addiction in a certain way, you know, like I feel my fingers start to do things, you know, and I can't sit still. It's that act of translating through the body that I somehow need, you know, to feel complete. I'm happy to play excellently. I'm very, you know, soothed when I feel I've played well as a pianist, but I'm much happier if I feel that something of that quality when I'm practicing gets transferred to everyone in the room. You've given them something. Yes, which is allowing the audience in, but also allowing the music to speak and allowing the time to feel generous. It's the kind of generosity that Dank felt 46 years ago on that couch in New Jersey. And after countless lessons and hours of practice, he can now give a similar lesson just by sitting down to play. You said your mom was beautiful and she knew it. How did you yeah. see yourself? After the break, more from my chat um, with Sandra Bullock. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more with Sandra Bullock. So I want to go back to the roots of your comedy. Okay. Because your mom was an opera singer. Yes. Dad, vocal coach. Mm -hmm. or yeah, he was an opera teacher. singer as well, but an opera teacher, a vocal. So yeah. music was clearly a big part of Rhythm, your life. Rhythm, music, yes. Where did the comedy come in? They were opera singers. There's nothing funny in operas. That becomes an operetta. And my mother was German. 
And I love my German family so much, but my mother had no sense of humor, unless you hurt yourself. My mother was absolutely beautiful. She was one of the most stunning women. She knew it, she worked it. So as a child, when you're walking next to your mother by, a, let's say, a construction site, there are certain sounds that come from that construction site towards your mother, but you're getting it as well as a child. And I would just fall all over myself. It was awkward, and she would just find that the funniest thing. And I, I realized that that kind of humor brought a smile to her and, and brought her joy. And um, I just went down that, that road. Right. But you know what? Laughing is everything. I think if we haven't figured that out, and I, I know we've not been very supportive of those who make us laugh. You know what I mean? Like, in, especially in film. You think comedy's kind of belittled, you oh, mean? Oh, for sure, for sure. No one does comedy for reviews, nobody. Um, unless you're French. And the French <laughs> always get revered for their comedy, and I'm like, oh, why can't we be like the French? So you eventually went to school for acting. You end up in New York mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You become a waitress. The precursor to acting is you become a waitress. Which I think everyone in life should do. I think you're absolutely right. If you, if you are in the way, if you know, know how to navigate uh, eight sets of six top tables, height of happy hour, drunk people, and you can do it without writing anything down, and you can remember everything, you can prevent yourself from being in the weeds. Once you've accomplished that kind of rhythm, I, feel, I honestly feel you can do anything. Because it's, it's a rhythm, timing, navigating personalities. It's a, it's a life skill. And I'm not kidding, I think, it's, I think it's a really important life skill. You said your mom was beautiful and she knew it. How did yeah. you see yourself? <laughs> um, I was, I was uh, what was considered a tomboy. Um, I was really athletic. Uh, I also knew that to be with the boys that I liked. It, I just was like, get on the skateboard, do all the things that they're doing, but I loved it. I was very athletic. Um, I didn't spend any time in front of a mirror because uh, I didn't think there was anything to, to you know, <laughs> What else can you do? Um, so my thing was um, humor, athletics, and I just had a lot of scraped knees and scars, and, and um, that, was, that was my lane. Your mom gave you some advice about allowing... <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I know, right? Which one? Practice, practice, practice. No, not that. Um, she told you to allow yourself to feel things. Yeah. Don't go through she life She said, don't not... be like me. Don't be like me. And she knew that I was... I think she could sense that I was... Not hardening, but my deflection is a, is a protector as well. Um, she raised, my dad always said, you, wrote, you raised our daughters to be too independent. My mom said, I'm gonna raise you so you don't need anyone else but yourself. She might have gone a little too far, but <laughs> you have to find a balance. You have to find the balance of vulnerability, yet have the tools for um, emotional survival, health, healthy emotional survival, but also in this day and age, things are different. You know, being a mom, you just have to be prepared. You just have to be prepared for the rest of your life. You gotta be prepared. All the mamas are going, yes, I know what you mean. Um, you just have to have a, 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 an armor on that is um, ready, but I'm ready. An armor, but also don't you feel like you're just like this skin covered heart walking? Bleeding heart? Around? Yes, God, yes, right? God, like, but there's nothing fragile about it. I don't look at it as a weakness anymore. You know, it is just my ability to love and my ability to navigate. And um, I, I used to think that my vulnerability was uh, uh, just utter weakness and fragility, and it's not. It's not. Um, and I'm not embarrassed about it anymore. Do you feel love now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I really like myself. I really like me. You know, I know I, know I have issues. <laughs> I know. Uh, my imperfections uh, rear their head uh, often, but they're mine, and they're not dangerous. They are, um, I know where they're from, uh, and, and I get to love, you know. What, I mean, I, I really, yes, my children's approval is very important to me, um, but what's more important to me is that I get to love them. It's an honor. It's a precious gift, yeah, right? It really is. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.